Okay, unmute my audio. Sorry guys, I don't have any sound for you yet. I'm working on it. Still no audio. I don't know why. There we go. Okay. I'm here and oh, I can there you go. Good. There you go. We got you. It's weird that Zoom was selecting my Thunderbolt hub that has a microphone port on it, even though the computer was not set for that. So I don't know yeah. why that was happening. But Okay. Well, I appreciate you logging on. Um, thanks uh, to Daniel and uh, Travis to kind of answer all of our questions. When you start asking me questions about uh, AirPeak, it's way beyond mine. It's so new yet. This is going to be a learning experience for me. So... Um, you know, thanks for, for taking the time. Oh, I thank you for taking the time. I, I really appreciate this. I, um, I, I will say that this is probably the um, most expensive item that I've purchased um, without, n with knowing about the, the least about it beforehand. Um, and so it makes me a little nervous um, to, to go ahead and do that when I, I don't have any experience with Sony with drones, and uh, of course nobody does. But there, there actually seems like there's a probably a little bit of a dearth of information, even with the you know what what was put out there. You know, we, but I've got a list of questions to a ask about it. Um, to begin with, I think what I probably want to do is share with you just a little bit about what my experience with with drones has been so far so and, and i don't know what yours is um but but at least you know what i know already um let's see i'm finding my list here um we started well, Travis, Travis told me earlier he's had over 250 flights with it already so he's got some good experience with it that's fantastic what kind of work are you doing with it travis uh, well, we're doing production work, some content creation, uh, doing inspection work as well. Uh -huh. We're doing everything short of anything with photogrammetry. Okay. Uh, does, so and and I'm not, because... I'm not going to do any of that, so I'm not worried about photogrammetry. So, um, yeah, it, it 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 sounds interesting, but it's not, you know, it's not something that I have ever done. And I, I mean, it, you know, if I have a bunch extra time and I need something to go and uh, screw around and learn more about, then maybe I'll do that. I'll probably do it with my Phantom 4 Pro. So, um, okay, the, my background with drones is I am a, I'm a real estate broker. That's my real job. 
Um, but I, I have a Sony A1, uh, a Sony A7R4, and a Sony A7R3, and I think I've got all but maybe three of the G Master lenses. I don't have the 400. I don't have the 85 because I'm not going to buy that 85. Um, I, for uh, lenses that go on this, I, I've seen a list. That's one of the things that I have a, a question for is can you, I found it somewhere and now I can't find it again, the list of compatible lenses. I think the only one that I don't have is the 85 millimeter. I think I own all the rest of the lenses that will go on the machine. So um, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm pretty into Sony stuff, and I do have a pretty strong, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable with, with Sony, but at the same time, I worry about buying something that's this new with, with as many unanswered un, uh, questions as I have so far. I, I started my very first drone that I ever had after giving it a shot several years before and, and not having a good experience because the drones didn't have GPS at that point. But I, I think the first real GPS drone that I had was probably the, the um, Inspire 1. And uh, I converted that to an Inspire 1 Pro when the X5S came out. And I've got, uh, I, I had a Phantom 3 Pro as the backup. I went to, uh, from the Inspire, a couple of Inspire ones, I went to uh, uh, Matrice M600 Pro. And I was carrying, that's when I switched to Sony. I was carrying a, a A7R4 with it. What am I saying? I'm, I was carrying an A7R2 with it. Um, and, and I moved because Canon had nothing that would do 4K video um, that was really light enough to carry with the, with the drone. Um, when the X7 came out, I got rid of the Matrice and I got the, the Inspire 2 with the X7. I still have it right here. I've got a Skydio 2. I've got, uh, I had the uh, Mavic uh, 2 Pro and the Mavic 2 Zoom. I've got a Mavic 3 Cine here. I've got a uh, uh, um, Phantom 4 Pro and I've got probably 600 hours on those. So um, I, I know how to fly one. I've got a Cine look. I know how to keep that in the air, sort of, but I'm not very good at it. So the thing that I'm excited about, I mean, honestly, I need to do more video with my drones, but most of what I do is photography with the drone. So I, I do lots of uh, landscape and architectural and nighttime cityscapes, which is probably the reason I'm most excited about flying an actual real camera. Um, so that's that's my background and experience. I've I've worked on some productions, um, you know. Done I, I, you know, I've 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 had work that I've done that has gone to cans, you know. I but not much. I don't. I that's not my focus. My focus is is uh, photography. So um, I, I I guess the the questions that I have to begin with is I think everybody is worried about the short flight time. Um, because it is pretty dang short compared to most of the other platforms that are out there. Um, the other one that I really uh, considered was buying the Freefly Astro. Um, they, you know, they're telling everybody that that flight time is like 25, 30 minutes kind of thing. Um, and I don't know how in the world they're doing that, but I know that that does not carry the same... Uh, it doesn't have sensors like this one does, um, so that that's a big issue um, for me, and that probably was ultimately the thing that made the difference. I've had the Matrice. When I sold the Matrice, it was so not portable, I send 180 pounds worth of batteries and gear away with it, and uh, I'm, I'm worried about getting anything that's a heavy lift that's that, that heavy, so this is about as big as I'm willing to go, and I'm, I'm super excited about it but a little worried about batteries. I'm a little worried about fret flight time. So I guess that's my first question. What's your experience been there? With the flight time? Mm-hmm. So uh, one thing to keep in mind when you're comparing the Air Peak and the Astro, that they're two different classes of 
aircraft. The Astro is 1,407 millimeters for the wheelbase, and the Air Peak is 644 millimeters. So it's wow. it's less than half the size of the Astro. Wow. Okay, that's huge. Yeah. So it's it's a much more compact uh, transportable system in that case. So to to go a step further, the Inspire. That's what you're familiar with. That's 605 millimeter wheelbase. So the Air Peak is just slightly larger than an Inspire. Yeah. So you're you're looking at about a ten and a half flight minute uh, flight time, ten and a half minute flight time, um, whenever you're flying extra aggressively at a high altitude with this system. On average, that's my been my experiences. What's considered um, high altitude? That's another thing I was a little worried about. Is that eight thousand uh, foot ceiling on the altitude? Is that something? There's one question. Is I've got questions about. What and maybe it's going to be feedback, not questions about things that that I think Sony needs to to come up with or address. And one of them is high altitude props. Uh, I I mean we're we're at my like my altitude right now is about five thousand feet right now. I've flown here in Utah at eleven thousand feet, so it's you know it's like well my takeoff point is higher than eight thousand feet, which this is rated for. So I'm, I'm concerned about that a little. Uh, I don't know exactly what, where we were flying, what the uh, mean sea level of the area we were flying in Utah was uh, in Ogden. But, you know, the system seemed to fly just fine. Um, and, and you might know what that mean sea level for that area is. It's about 4,500, 5,000. So, okay. Yeah. So it's still beneath the 8,000. But I agree with you. Um, and I can't necessarily comment on what they are uh, doing in the future. But this is something known. This okay. is a known thing, right? Okay. The, the higher, the high altitude props, similar to how DJI has high altitude props. Um, but well, so, you know, back to the flight time. You have a five and a half pound max payload with this aircraft, and one thing I've noticed is you, you, the the flight time at five and a half pounds is around around ten minutes at ten and a half minutes, and any less, you know, you you gain you gain seconds to course. a couple minutes. Okay. Um, Depending on how aggressively you're flying, depending on altitude, depending on all sorts of different, you know. Uh, of course, uh, uh, of course. Yeah, yeah, depending on all that. So, but the Air Peak is just a little bit bigger than Inspire, um, carrying a full size, full frame uh, mirrorless camera, right? Five and a half pounds, uh, max payload. So, if you were to put that on an Inspire, your Inspire probably wouldn't fly for that for 10 and a half minutes. Probably not. No, uh, and that's why the air peak, that's why the, air, the flight time is the way it is, is because of the wheelbase. But they uh, are aware that the flight time is not, uh, doesn't have the best taste in the mouth, so they are trying to uh, make adjustments with that, uh, from my understanding. Okay, well, good. Let me, let me throw in, uh, Drew, I'm Dan. Hi, Dan. Yep. Uh, I worked for Sony for a long time and left, actually, for startup drone company. Hmm. Uh, I worked for FreeFly for a couple of years, and then after that I went to uh, Aerialtronics, um, European brand, uh, and then uh, Sony asked me to come back and help out with, uh, with the drone business here at Sony. Um, so I, I have some experience with FreeFly. Um, I know the guys at FreeFly, and we have a very open and, and frequent dialogue about a lot of things. The Astro... Um, has these longer flight times uh, specs, and it's rated at 37 minutes with no payload. It's rated at 25 minutes with a slightly over three pound payload. But when you put, um, but when you put a full five plus plus minus pound payload on the Astro. Um, you're getting something that is a lot more like what we're getting okay. and what, what Travis has been getting in actual flight um, uh, demonstrations and when we've done um, uh, inspections at medium uh, uh, altitude. Okay. Um, it, the, the other thing, the, the, um, the Air Peak is so much more versatile with the number of different uh, frames, uh, full uh, camera frames and lens combinations uh, that you can use. Yeah, I, I knew that. That's one of the reasons that that uh, I said now I'm going to go with Sony is is the 
the Freefly Astro, last time I checked, was approved for one lens, which is the 35mm f2.8 from Zeiss, which is old to begin with. I went, I went and bought it because I figured, oh, there's going to be a run on them. Um, but uh, I, I, I've got that one. I've got the new set that I think, I mean, I think that Sony built the FS3 to fly it. And I, I think that they, uh, and I, I'm not going to buy that one because I've sold my A7S III to buy the A1. Um, but, but I also bought the small set of 2.8 lenses because I also think that Sony built those to fly them as well, um, is my opinion. But I, I anticipate longer flight times with smaller payloads. Of course, that's going to be a, a difference. I mean, you know, I, I was with... John McBride with Rocky Mountain Unmanned Systems when we lifted a chainsaw with for firefighters with a with a um, Matrice M600, but you know that might get you eight minutes of flight time if you're lucky because uh, and and I think that's one thing that people that have been flying integrated cameras with DJI don't really understand or recognize yeah. because they never had to deal with that or balancing a gimbal either so. Um, I, I, I think that that's one of the reasons that Sony's going to get feedback and pushback is because people are coming from the wrong platform. Yeah, L let me say one other, you're right, you're exactly right. Um, let, let me say one other thing about uh, flight time. Sony is an extremely green company. Um, the batteries that we make are the greenest by far uh, in the industry. The guys in uh, the factory, the engineers in the factory, know that's not enough. Uh, it's shipping um, the end of this month, and it'll have batteries that will allow that um, that flight time that we very conservatively post. Okay. But but two things are happening. Um, they're already working on the next uh, battery for this same aircraft. You you won't have an outdated drone the new batteries that we'll have will be longer flight um i can't tell you exactly when they're coming yet what you're saying is enough it's going to cost you a couple of sales because i yeah. i'm buying three sets of batteries i would buy more but i i will wait a little bit okay all right and there's there's another idea um it's not so much an idea but there's another thing that's happening there are um very big drone battery companies uh, who are already getting, already starting to knock off our battery. Okay. Now, I, I'm not recommending those. Um, they won't be as green, uh, but they should also allow longer flight time. Okay. Um, again, I can't tell you uh, exactly when those will be out, but I guarantee you at CES, we're, we're going to CES the 5th through the 8th of January. Um, and there will be a swarm of ma uh, battery manufacturers that come to our booth that will take pictures of our batteries and, and whatever they need to do uh, to knock them off. So I can say that about what, what's going on with, with batteries in the future. Well, I appreciate, I appreciate that and I will let you know I don't use aftermarket mat batteries in my cameras. Yeah, all right. <laughs> I won't. I won't. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, let's see. How much is, uh, okay, we know that the app is iOS. It's iOS compatible, um, and, and that's great. Now, I've seen cords. I mean, I've been watching Japanese unboxings from, yeah, I don't speak Japanese. I speak Korean, but I don't speak Japanese. Um, but I've been watching these, uh, let's see, these Japanese unboxings, and I've seen cables that will connect the remote to, uh, you know, just a, like a USB-A to uh, 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 lightning port. Um, but will does it come with one that hooks it to an iPad with the USB-C, like an A to C? It I mean, is, yeah. I, I, I probably have one. But... With that cable, though. Okay. I, I think I have a couple of good ones, so I think I'll be okay. But I was wondering if it came with one. Um, how... How much is Sony Care, and how uh, how does that work? It, it, I mean, I translated it from yen, and it looks like about thirteen hundred bucks, but I don't know. It, 
So all the details aren't out yet. They're going to come out literally on Friday. Yeah, maybe Friday. <laughs> Sorry about that's, that. It's early for us. <laughs> Sorry about that, but um, yeah, that's that's pretty close. It'll actually be, I think, a couple hundred dollars less than that. Okay. Um, and there's a whole suite of options and reasons that 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 this whole thing is a good idea. Um, you know, quick turnaround time with service. Uh, U.S. Uh, servicing starts with uh, service in LA, uh, but will quickly expand to other locations where Sony has service facilities. Okay. Um, um, so that's that. There's also um, there's also um, a one or two. I'll, I'll wait to see what they decide on uh, ability, if need be, if you think it's the right thing to do, uh, to send it in and and get a replacement piece. Okay. So that's a part of the of the extended warranty that's that's there. There's of course uh, the manufacturer's warranty, uh, which covers the thing whether you buy anything breaks. else or not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then additionally, um, there's a couple of choices with um, uh, the uh, software uh, mm -hmm. available, and Travis knows a little bit more about uh, Air Peak uh, Base versus uh, um, a, a, another option that you can have. Uh, I'll let Travis talk about uh, that specifically, but um, really good warranty, really good additional uh, options to purchase, quick turnaround time, uh, expanded to national uh, 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 facilities for quick turnaround. Okay. Travis, tell me more about the software. And I'm going to grab a drink because of my mouth strike. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Yeah, once you get back here. Oh, I'm right here. I can hear you. I'm, I got oh, okay. I'm, so, I'm Air, 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 Air Peak Base um, is a, it's, it's a mission planning software. It's also where you manage or maintain your fleet. So, all your flight logs are going to be uploaded into Air Peak Base. It's a web app. Uh, so it's a web-based application that can be opened up on a browser. It's not native. It's not native to a PC nor a tablet, okay. um, so you can use it on either. Uh, it's hard to, to to create missions though on Air Peak Base. Air Peak Base is a very high-level um, uh, waypoint tool. Uh, currently, what you get with it for free is the ability to to create these high-level waypoints manage your fleet, do your logs, but to do any type of export or create any geofences, that's uh, uh, going to be an uh, upgraded service. And I'm, I don't know if they have pricing for that just yet. Dan, do you know what the pricing might be? I do. Not quite yet. I, I, okay. I, I mean, what I've seen says $300 a year. So, okay. So okay. That, that's, so that's that actually... They got on the there. Site? Yeah, I think so. Um, I can't tool. Well, anyways, well, sorry about that, but yeah, so Air Peak Base is a, uh, an upgradable application or software that you can use with your Air Peak to you manage your logs and, uh, and to uh, create missions. But the Air Peak Flight app is the application that's used, similar to DJI Go 4. Yeah. Uh, it's a very clean layout. You have a lot of custom options, custom, uh, customization options for your, your buttons on your radio. Uh, there is no paid upgrade with that. It is what it is. Uh, you're able to uh, view your main camera, the FPV camera, uh, change aperture, shutter, exposure, ISO, uh, all those things uh, via, uh, via the app. You can change the focus settings as well. Um, you don't have absolute control of your alpha through it, so you're not necessarily able to open up the full alpha menu uh, through the Air Peak Flight app. Uh, but you are able to uh, make uh, image setting adjust adjustments. Um, now, for you, for someone who has some ex experience flying, you know you might want to kind of uh, fine tune the way the aircraft performs. And that's going to be something that's going to be really uh, impressive to you when you get this aircraft, especially when you've been flying so many DJI systems over the years. Uh, this system does a very, very good job at being stable and maintaining the speed that you want to maintain, maintaining altitude. Even when you're experiencing heavy gusts and you have it, say, banked to a 55 degree attitude, even though you're changing the direction of thrust, 
This aircraft does not like to drop. I don't even wouldn't even say more than an inch visually. Okay. You can't. You definitely don't see any uh, uh, difference on the application. Um, but you're able to also fine tune how the aircraft performs. You're able to put dead zones okay. to where you like if you uh, don't want to uh, be super sensitive if you're afraid that you might bump. Uh, the, the sticks and, and ruin a sh shot and you want to have some wiggle room you're able to kind of create that with the dead zone you're able to adjust expo you're able to adjust your rates and you're also able to tune the gimbal through the airpeak flight app too so notice that you know it's a grimsy gimbal that was my that was my that was my question is do you can i mean that that was one of my that's on my list is can you tune oh yeah tune it through Sony's app or do you have to download a separate Grimsy app and I, I was hoping that you would say what you just said because yeah. I, I want it to be integrated rather than dealing with something that's a separate a separate uh, <clears throat> you know issue uh, to, to, to deal with the dampening and stuff on the gimbal I've seen I've seen the gimbal it looks okay um, I, I've also but I've seen like banking turns where I, you know, I'm like not super impressed with the stability of it, but they're probably taken last winter, and so I'm like, you know, I wonder how much work has been done on it since then. So I'll let you in on something about some of the production shots with with uh, the Air Peak. Sometimes we were making lens changes and not having time to make gimbal to, tune changes to balance it with the new gimbal. Well, not necessarily balance it, but to, to tune it, right, to, tune to, it. to uh -huh. stiffness settings. And so sometimes that will affect whenever you're making an aggressive bank and you're throwing all that centrifugal force out on, on the gimbal, and it's, it's got it's one to a you know, state level, yeah. right? Uh -huh. It's If you don't have the uh, stiffness settings uh, dialed in, then, then you're going to have problems. But stiffness settings are extremely easy to do. Um, and it's just a matter of the timing. If you have somebody like, hey, next shot, next shot, next shot, then timing becomes difficult. But I'll say this, this is another thing they recognize that out in the field, timing is uh, of, of essence, of the essence. So what I imagine in the future, and this has been recommendations, is it's gonna recognize which lens and camera oh, wow. and, and, and will tune accordingly that, that's that, something that it should be able to do because it has all it, it's able to it's, it communicates and they, they recognize that too that, but, that's even better i was just going to say just make it so that the preset settings for each lens are in a drop down menu but you're right if it can if it can tell which lens is being used and it can because it's in the it, metadata so it may as well go ahead and do that here's another question and i'm jumping a little bit ahead is there any flexibility? Um, for example, the one lens that I have that's a great lens that I didn't choose to go with the G Master is the Sigma 85 because I think it for the money it's a better lens than, than the current G Master 85 is. It's 200 grams over the weight of the heaviest um, uh, Sony approved lens which i think is the 14 or is it the 50 i can't remember that that it's approved to carry right now did i that's one i can't remember for sure is it approved to carry the 50 millimeter f1.2 or is it a different 50 uh it's, i think it's a different 50 i think it's the uh uh the 25 uh, that kind of yeah I, i've got that one the little one but i thought that that was so the G Masters are the 24, the 14, and the 35 then, right? Yeah, let's see. Actually, I can pull this up here just to double check to go along with you. Um, yeah, so as for the 85, it's up to the, the 18. Um, yeah, but the 85 isn't a G Master. It's not that heavy. And, and, and you got the 24, 14 G Master... Any of the G Masters are going to be much heavier than the fourteen eighteen G Master. Yeah, uh, it's able to. Okay, I I think I think if I remember right, it's the it's the fourteen G Master, the twenty four G Master, and the thirty five G Master, and then there's the twenty. It'll carry the twenty that's not a G Master. It'll carry the forty, and the thirty, and the fifty that are the little ones, the little guys, and then it'll carry that weird the Zeiss 35 and then it will carry 
I can't remember which 50 exactly, and it'll carry the F, the the 85 1.8. So I think that's 50, all. Yeah, the 52.5. I'm looking at the list. And I, I've got that Here little guy. I post the list okay. in the chat. Okay, let's see. Oh, there you go. Oh, nice. there we go. Yeah, no problem. And what I'm also going to do for these occasions is I'm going to get together a, a, a cheat sheet with um, uh, weights along with this. But I will say this about about the Air Peak and your question. Um, the Air Peak. Uh, is can carry five and a half pounds and you know I, I think the understanding is is it's it's your aircraft when it's your aircraft if it can if it's within the weight limit um, that they can carry it okay good it's, it's payload yeah so you know and that five and a half pounds includes your gimbal and the Gremsey right how much is the Gremsey I think that's 2.2 pounds. 2.65 pounds is 2. the gram. 2.65. And so... Well, I, know, <clears throat> I know this thing we were talking about, that thing's crazy heavy, though. Is yeah, it? What, what I, does that weigh? I, I don't know. Most Sigmas are, but that Sigma is the little one that's been... That and the 35 are the ones that have been redesigned. Of course, all of theirs are probably heavy. Let's see. It's the Sigma... Is it the Art? It, yeah, it is. It's a it's a beautiful lens when I was that's the, that's the only one that I ever tell anybody that I would go with Sigma over the G Master and the G Master is good it's just I think that one's just a little bit better it's it's the oldest lens in our lineup yeah exactly it's, it's due for a redesign just like the new 70 uh, oh yeah Alpha Rumor says that it's a uh, new one's coming I I sold my Actually, I still have my 70 to 200. I sold my 24 to 70 as well in anticipation. So Yeah, me, me too. <laughs> and I don't know anything. And I yeah. All right. Well, I, I think it's coming. I think the 85 is coming. I think those are the first three that they're going to redo. So I, I agree. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm looking for the 85 right here to see how much it weighs. I'm just trying to decide whether or not I need to buy another 85. For me, the long end of the lens spectrum is the most important thing because um, because those give me shots that you they don't look like they're from a drone. There we go. Uh, show more. I found it. I, I mean, my favorite pictures that I ever take from my Inspire two are taken with a 50 millimeter which is really a 75 you know so okay specs there it is it weighs 1.38 pounds or 625 grams 625 grams uh-huh for the the 85 1.4 dg dn art the, the difference is is that that one and the 35 are the revised optical formula that don't just essentially have a, a adapter slapped on the back of, of one of their other lenses. This one is actually short and compact and relatively small compared to most of the art. So this one and the new 35 millimeter are the ones that are the, the new ones from them. So, but see, I think, I think the heaviest one is the um, 14 millimeter G Master? Yeah, you're uh, with that. You'd be just above it, 5.68 with the Alpha One, and the gimbal. So, it's close. Does the A7R4 weigh less than the Alpha? It does. The R4 is just a little lighter. Yeah, by just somewhat. I'm not certain exactly. But double check here. Not much, but a little bit. No, not by much at all. The truth is, is unless I'm planning on doing video, my guess is that I'm going to fly the R4 more than anything else on this. That's what I fly a lot of, uh, just because it is a little bit lighter. Um, and do a lot of the inspection stuff. So, yeah, uh, yeah, it's really not that much. It's like 100 grams lighter than the Alpha 1. Okay. 
But, but if this is, I mean, then, then that I would, think that would put you in what you need to be, though. Yeah, then I think you're only like maybe even a hundred grams over, if that. So, um, let's see. Yeah, that would put you in the window. Okay. Okay. Um, any any plans to put a powered lens on this thing or design one for it? There is a powered lens. I think it's 16 to 35, so it's not uh, anything extreme. Um, but currently, the other power lens, power lenses that would be great for this aircraft, just way too much at the moment. So, Dan, do you know of anything? Have you heard of anything? I know we mm -hmm. talked about this a little while back. No, just the <clears throat> just the one that you mentioned. But it is. Um, there is a couple of lenses that we may be able to get our hands on um, and a couple of new ones that they were thinking about that they may be thinking about bringing to market quicker uh, uh, now that the drone is out and there's a call for it. Okay. So, so stay posted. We'll, we'll keep you posted on that. Okay. Um, and uh, the David as well. So... Uh, we know what those are as we get a little closer. Okay. Um, tell me what you know about um, about the obstacle avoidance system on it. It looks like I've seen downward sensors on the rear sensor, uh, I don't know, module. It, it looks like it has rear and down on there. And then side to side, I've seen that. And then obviously on the pilot cam, there's a set. Is there upward sensors on it? I don't even know that. Yep, yep. So it's got uh, five uh, stereo sensors and two infrared sensors. So the infrared sensors are on the top and downward. So upward facing infrared and downward facing infrared. Uh, the stereo is uh, on, on all sides and then are except for the top. So okay. it's on your sides and on the bottom, but no stereo sensor on the top of it. Um, have you seen the video of uh, it flying through the tunnel, the airbnb flying through the tunnel? It sounds or, familiar, but I don't remember that. that that's so, awesome. Oh, man. So the, the air peak is on a different kind of level with collision avoidance. It's not like DJI collision avoidance. It's like it's, it's using SLAM algorithms, so simultaneous localization and mapping. Uh, so it's similar to what the Skydio uses. Um, it, it, only Sony has its own you know, proprietary SLAM algorithm, its own proprietary processor that it's using to, to, to determine its location and map the location in real time. Um, I'll say this, it can view, it can see this around uh, beyond 50 meters away. One thing that I really love about the collision avoidance is it's very smart. So it, say you're booking it, going really, really, really fast towards an object, the collision avoidance will enable uh, a good distance before you get to the object uh, in accordance to what you have your active braking set on. So if you have your brake active braking to be very, very uh, kind of aggressive, slow. Oh yeah, okay, yes, slow. It will, it will, or very sensitive, either or vice versa. It will actually, depending on your speed, determine when, do it, when it actually needs to brake. And then on the other hand, say you're going pretty slow to an object, it will let you get very close to the object because it has so much control at that speed, right? Wow. It has so much control of whether it's going to keep going and hitting or not. So it, it, it has, it's very smart, intuitive collision avoidance that seems to uh, sense a lot, pick up, it picks up a lot. Okay. Um, that, that's, yeah. that's a big deal for me. I, it, it's not, but it is, it, I, I'm, old school enough that I don't fly as if I have collision avoidance. I, I need to get more comfortable with that. With the Skydio, it scared the hell out of me the first few times I flew it until I started getting used to it. But I don't fly as if I have collision avoidance. I fly like a grandpa most of the time. I'm not a grandpa yet, but I'm getting there. Um, because, because I'm nervous about hitting something, which I have done back with Inspire 1 more than once. Um, and so it's it's you know, it's it's an expensive lesson to learn, so I've I've learned not to fly that way. So, um, I you know these guys that are like trying to fly it through trees and around bushes and stuff like that for these tests. It's like I don't I I've never experienced that. I even with my mini whoop, I'm like you know they're like oh you can fly it wherever. I'm like uh, okay I got to get that mindset because I don't I I'm not aggressive. But that being said, 
there have been a couple of times when collision avoidance on the Inspire 2 has kicked in when I didn't even realize that something was, you know, I'm using a lens that doesn't have a field of view that that allows me to see everything or whatever, and I would have hit something, but I didn't even realize it was there, you know. So it's it's nice to have, but I don't fly as if if that, you know, it's like a seatbelt for me. Not something that's a, a part of my navigation preference. So, but flying through a tunnel, you know, obviously that's one of those situations where it's like, man, if it's if it's strong enough that that you can haul butt on your way through, and I think I do remember seeing that on one of the videos, then that that is, you know, that's kind of a different level. That's awesome. So and that's all going on inside the aircraft. And that's, that model is, is actually being generated within the aircraft, so it actually recognizes where it is in this space. It's not, it's not like other you know, collision avoidance systems that just picks up something at a distance, doesn't know what it is, doesn't recognize its depth or anything like that, it just picks up and knows that it needs to stop. This is fully generating a, an, an area that it needs to traverse through. Like a wireframe. It just builds a wireframe model that it knows is there and just hauls butt through it. That's yes, awesome. it's very cool. Okay. Um, let's see. Man, I had another good question based on that. Um, it, it, the, I can't remember what that was, but I've got another one. Um, how limited is it by light? if that's the case, the ob obstacle avoidance? I think so. They, they say that uh, you don't want to be using the stereo sensors in a low light situation. Um, we have flown the system in a darker environment. Not, I wouldn't say it was uh, beyond the 30 minutes past civil, you know, evening civil twilight. It was within that 30 minute realm. Um, and we had no problems with uh, any type of error or anything like that. Uh, but I, I can't imagine it does very good when it gets dark. So, like, if I were to turn the lights off in this room and power this thing on, it would say, hey, too dark to operate the vision sensors. I, I know it would. Well, maybe not right now because it's daylight, but if it was dark out. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, when you have, so, when you have some light, and at least enough lights where it can uh, sense, uh, I'd say, plus 10 meters out, then you're, you're in a good good area okay. because it really sees up to 50 meters oh wow uh, it, it sees it very far away and you can tell one thing that might be somewhat annoying with your with the collision avoidance system is how sensitive it can be say you're doing a super high speed orbit around uh around a, an object and you have a bush that's 20 feet beneath the aircraft clearly not going to run in, your aircraft's not going to run into this bush but the, the, the sensor will pick that up, and every time you whip around and get to it, it's like it wants to slow down because, you know, you're, you're coming close to this obstacle that it feels like it might hit. So in some cases, what you would do Flip for a, certain, like for a mm. shot, not to ruin your shot, just turn it off. Yeah. yeah. You know, if you don't want your shot screwed up, just turn that off. No, that, that makes complete sense, I, and, and I can see where that would be. I, I was, like, literally... As far as I know, I was the first guy in my state to get a, a night waiver. Um, I, you know, I got I got my Part 107 like within a month of them coming out with it, and I had my night waiver by this, uh, January of the next year. So I was one of the very first, and probably 25, maybe um, maybe 30 percent of my flying is is full dark when it when it's nighttime out i i fly at night a lot um one of my favorite things to do is uh nighttime cityscapes and so that's one of the reasons that this drone makes such a huge difference to me but one of the things that it, that leads me to my next question is is um one of the things that i've always been intrigued with was rtk on drones i've never owned an rtk drone because of, of its ability to hold that still for longer exposure times. How still does this thing, let's say it's not a super gusty, windy day. On a normal, you know, maybe very light breeze or no breeze at all, how still will this hold? Extremely still. And, and, and that's even with heavy gusts. So even at a low altitude where it's not getting a very good GPS signal uh, for, for its altitude uh, reading, it's, it's simply using the vision sensors, it's, it's extremely still. And then when you get even higher, right, and you, and you have a better signal, 
better barometer readout, and your vision sensors are still running. You, it, it, it handles heavy gusts in such a way that I've not seen an aircraft of this wheelbase handle before. And I, I, I have flown, you know, uh, beyond DJI systems, flown a lot of European systems, flown a lot of custom systems and stuff. And this one is one of the more unique aircraft I've ever flown. Um, even though it doesn't have real-time kinematics, the RTK stuff, uh, the vision sensors, the vision positioning uh, combined with the barometer chosen and the GPS uh, uh, compass used, it, it's so great. Let me, I want to comment on that compass. It's a very unique situation with this aircraft. I have turned this aircraft on in my living room to do tests and have connected to 18 satellites in my living room. Wow. Turned it on at a hotel and connected to 16 satellites. I even called the other pilot one time when we did this. I was like, this is weird. This drone's connected to satellites in, in this hotel. Like, this is a compass on steroids. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very, very accurate. It, it holds position very well. And then again, to comment on, uh, it would be more of your, your TPA, your throttle pit attenuation, the way they have this tuned in this aircraft. Whenever the aircraft is getting hit by a, uh, an excessively large gust and it has to adjust attitude to, you know, beyond 30, 35 degrees, say 55 degrees is this max attitude adjustment, you don't see a drop in altitude. Uh, you might see some jitter in your video, but you won't see a drop in altitude. And, and I know for your situation, it's a long exposure that would mess you up. Mm -hmm. um, but something else that will benefit you in night flight with this aircraft is it's got extremely bright LEDs. Mm -hmm. uh, they're they're very 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 bright. So with 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 doing a night flight, you should be able to see this aircraft a very good distance away. Um, you know, going to the the, the stated range at 1.2 miles. We in our tests um, have found that to be very difficult to see the aircraft in daytime at that range. And so we're not going to breach what the FAA will allow us. I, 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 I understand that. I honestly, I think the Mavic 3's range is criminal. I don't think that they, I, I think they should do something about that. It, it, it bothers me that, that there isn't some sort of regulation that sits there and says, you, I mean, it's, it's like, it's like they're, they're obviously they regulate the height on the Mavic 3. You know, they regulate all their stuff to no more than 1600 feet. And I fly higher than that, well, as high as that all the time because I've got mountains right here where I can fly up the side of the mountain and it kind of pisses me off that there's a ceiling there and I've actually unlocked that more than once by calling and asking. But it's like they should, they really should put like a, a two mile limit on the distance away from the controller that you can fly. And then on top of that, let it have the the transmission capability to fly the uh, the two miles, because what I love is is the power is important if you're like flying right over treetops or something like that. I did like a ton of my hours came from chasing kids on mountain bikes for mountain bike races, and so I had the Inspire One and then I had my Matrice all decked out in blaze orange stickers. For the Skydio 2, I've got a Blaze Orange sticker set coming because then, you know, your how far away you can actually see it, how far you can fly it is legal for a further distance. So I want to be able to say, yeah, I can see it. It's further. Yeah, I know it's two miles away. I can still see it, you know, against a green background. The Blaze Orange stands out. I I can still see it. And and so I I it's not... You know, I honestly, I think 1.2 miles is far enough away, but I'm concerned about the power of the transmitter to fly in a congested Wi-Fi environment at 1.2 miles away. How's, what's your experience with that? So I have not, uh, we've flown in a lot of different environments. We've been doing a lot of cell tower inspections too, and flying around substations. One substation we flew around uh, was in Utah. We got told that if, if we wrecked the drone into this, then we were gonna be in major trouble. I don't remember exactly how many areas or parts of the state would have went out, lost power, but there was some serious EMF coming off of it. And the drone never had a problem. We flew that thing, I mean, I would say, 
close to a mile away. It was within 4,000, 5,000 feet between that, so close to a mile, and had no problem. Now, that's not necessarily in a congested area with Wi-Fi, but that, you know, that's around these uh, substation where that has, uh, you know, multi-path interference and, and uh, a, a, a load of things could happen, and mm -hmm. we didn't have any problems. And the only time I've had a connectivity issue with the aircraft is there's been one time and it was determined to be because of the dual operation use of it. Mm. And we had dual operator use, and this was a firmware thing. And that has been since solved. Then that was a, it was a funny thing. It would lose it and then back, lose it back, lose it back, you know, real quick. But um, I haven't had a, uh, a uh, loss of link caused by uh, any type of uh, uh, interference like that. Okay. Um, yeah. That that that's important. I'm 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 still nervous about it, but that that helps. The other thing that I've looked at is you know I with with DJI obviously you get your flight logs that are logged into your account, and I've looked at it, and the truth is is that probably seventy five percent of my flights are under twelve minutes anyhow. But my concern with the battery life is that you know if you leave twenty percent, really I'm looking at nine minutes of actual flight time if you have 20% that you need to, you know, build in just for safety. And so that, that it, you know, flight time does make me a little nervous, but that that's important. I have not ordered my second remote yet. I will, but I'm not like, you know, I'm not desperate for that because that's not the way I'm going to start. Anyhow, um, I, I've probably flown dual op 20 times in the last four years, if that. So um, not, not super often, but I have crashed the drone. I've crashed an Inspire one and because of microwave interference and I've crashed, almost crashed an Inspire two on top of McClure Pass in Colorado at 10,000 feet um, because I didn't know that there was a microwave station and I was like, what the heck? And I, I had to get it down quick because I was right next to a high, highway and I, I banged the gimbal on the ground and uh, and hurt two of the props, but it wasn't it wasn't the end of the world. It was pretty. I mean, considering that I you know it flips it over into ATTI. Oh, there's a question. ATTI. Yeah. It we have the ability to switch to ATTI if you wanted to. Yes. Okay. Yes. Good. Yes, and attitude mode is a very unique kind of beast too because it actually still uses the vision sensors to some extent to to hold position. Oh, to some extent so it's it's no gps right but it, and the reason you you have attitude is to to be able to fly a little bit more aggressively and in those cases where you have a multi-path propagation issue and your gps gets hijacked you want to kill it right mm -hmm. but if your vision sensors don't get hijacked and they're native to the aircraft why why not why turn them off why, yeah. why eliminate them right keep yeah. them on so they the attitude mode is assisted in stability by those vision sensors so it doesn't get bullied around by heavy winds like a other system would to the extent another system would. It still gets bullied, but not as badly. You okay. know? Yeah, you don't find it leaning up against some building like a mile and a half away um, be, because it's not hitting a building because the vision sensor is preventing it, but it drifted off and you lost it. <laughs> yeah, so you'll still, um, I, you know, I think you, it, it, you can still keep the obstacle uh, avoidance system sensors on i'll have to double check on that for you i don't okay. don't quote me on that one i have your email this will be a, a follow-up okay i appreciate uh, that yeah no problem um the other questions and these you know i know how companies work you're probably gonna say well i can't confirm or deny or say anything either way if if a patch antenna was developed would we need to open the remote to attach it? Um, so, yeah, that's what you said. You know, uh, if you would have to do that, you would have to open the remote. Are the, um, are the antennas screw on or are they permanently attached to the remote as it stands? Um, or are they completely internal? The, oh, they're internal. The antennas are internal. Okay. Yeah. So your antenna is actually built into the handle of the radio. Are you familiar with spectrum radios? No. One second, actually. 
Travis, you got it behind you on the yeah. track. You read my mind, Dan. <laughs> All right. So this is your antenna. Oh, okay. Got it. So yeah, so it is built into the, the radio. You would have to take take the radio apart here to, 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 get to, to get to the circuit board to attach the antenna. Yes. Okay. Now, um, Dan, am I allowed to comment on the attachments on the inside of this, or is that something that if you were to want to open it, you can you'll figure it out? Oh, um, it can. You can talk about it. It can be done, but that it, it's not a conversion that we support. Let's put it that right. That will ruin your Leave warranty. <laughs> yep. Right. What Dan said. Yeah. <laughs> Have you been inside of it? I've seen inside of it. Okay. Yeah. And so, uh, would soldering be required, or can you unplug something from a circuit board? Um, I, I don't know really what, how much I'm able to comment on the inside of this, to okay. be honest. Yeah. Okay. Um, this would be something that, you know, if you have it, uh, there's, there's screws, you can definitely get into it and, and kind of see what's happening on it on the inside yourself okay the next question i've got is as far as chargers go can you use like a diversity charger that you use for uh you know charging either big heavy lifts or a regular one or is it limited to the sony charger specifically sony charger specifically okay. we it's our proprietary contacts our it's our own connection um, and the charging dock is awesome. It is, it's, you just drop the battery in, slides right in, starts charging. You don't, I haven't had a time where I had to go back and be like, I thought I put the battery on charge. Like, and it didn't, you know, fully seat. How it long, always seems to seat. How long does it take to charge a, a battery or a set? Will it, does it charge both of them at the same time or does it do one and then the other? One and then the other. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately. Uh, it's not, it's not terrible. It, um, is there a recommendation that you keep battery sets paired? No. So these are lithium ion batteries. Uh, they're a little bit more forgiving than lithium polymer. Okay. So even in, in to your, your, you mentioned the 20% rule earlier, something you will notice with the aircraft is your flight times are consistent, but the time that your battery says it's low is not going to be consistent. So you might get a flight to all the way to where it's 7% before it says it's low. And then your flight time is 10 and a half minutes, you know, flying. This is my experience that I'm speaking of. But then you're going to be flying where your battery life is at 27% and it says it's low, but you flew for 10 and a half minutes. So uh, it, the, the determination for when the aircraft should land is based on uh, the distance you're flying as well, similar to how DJI. So does. it's figuring out how long it takes for you to get home. Yes, has an algorithm yes. that does that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I, I'm just wondering if you had to keep them paired because the thing is, is like if you, like if you need another five minutes on station or something, and you've got one charged full battery, I, let, that's a question. Will it allow you to take off again if you've got one battery that is charged differently than the other? You have about twenty percent margin. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so if it's a 20% difference, then yeah, you should be able, you can. Um, I don't necessarily recommend that uh, because what you'll get into then is a, uh, a, a potential to have one battery, say, beneath 3.5 volts per cell and the other above. And that other battery beneath that then will be having a very hard time at supplying current needed uh -huh. because once you get be up, beyond 3.5, slows then, down. Then you run into yeah. problems, yeah. Um, and that's okay. something else to comment on that, again, with this aircraft, actually, is you don't see a difference in flight performance or throttle authority at, at a low battery uh, percentage. And so a lot, a lot of aircrafts, and a lot of people don't necessarily notice this too often unless, uh, because you're, you're typically landing around when your batteries are dying. But if you have a situation where you have to throttle back up, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, TPA, uh, it, it sometimes you're, the throttle is not able to respond the way you want to respond or at least maintain stability, stability while responding because it doesn't have the current uh, needed for that. Right. Uh, and the air peak has not, uh, from, my, uh, from what I've seen, exhibited anything like that. It has very good uh, responsiveness even at a low battery level. 
Okay. Um, how many cycles are the batteries rated for? That's a great question. I'll have to get back to you on that one. Okay. Um, we, I want to say 100 hours. Well, we do have somewhere, Travis, and I'll help you find it, the yeah. number of cycles uh, uh, guaranteed by Sony for that, for each battery. Okay. And I, yeah. I mean, obviously, I know that the way you treat your batteries makes a difference as far yep. as that goes. You know, the, the, the one thing is, is that without having a lot of them that I worry about is putting stuff back on a charger when it's still warm. I try not to do that, but if I don't have enough sets, then you end up putting it on when it's still warm because you need to use it as soon as possible again. Um, but I, I anticipate that to begin with, I'm gonna have my three sets, I'm gonna go fly them, and then I'm flying tomorrow again. But you know, that it's not a, it's not a stress kind of situation. I, I also think that I'm going to end up needing to buy a second charger um, it, it, from what it sounds like. So I would do that, to be honest, uh, because otherwise you're going to be looking at two hours to yeah. charge uh, for one flight. You know, since it charges battery after battery, it's an hour per battery. And then if, you're, if you have two chargers, then you, you, you have an hour of cutting flights. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you can keep your, bar your batteries buried. It's not a, a recommendation, but, uh, you know, you, you should. It's mm. still lithium it's chemistry. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. You know, you sh it's, it's still a wise thing to do. Okay. Um, how does the remote um, charge in it? How many flights can you get on a charge? Um, how long does it take to charge? How does it charge? So the remote takes uh, around two hours to charge from my experience. Um, and we get about six hours out of it. Uh, so you would get about two good days of flying. Good, two good work okay, days that's of flying. Good. That's good. So one of the things that I've, I loved about when the Ascendance came out is being able to slap an extra battery in. If, if it's dead, you just pop that extra battery and you're up and going again. Um, the other thing is, is uh, having a crystal sky is, was huge too. I, I am not an Android guy, but the ability to, I mean, what I'm going to end up having to do is I anticipate that sometimes, you know, you run the iPad dead and now I'm going to have to use a phone. And so I'm not really excited about that. Um, but, you know, I mean, replacing the entire device rather than replacing a battery um, is, is interesting. The other thing is, is I think I'm probably going to end up, I've got a, a the large size, th there's a question, will the large size iPad fit in that holder? Uh, yes, I believe that's what we are using is the larger size iPads here. The 12, 12 inch one or whatever, yeah. Yeah, so that's uh, your holder. Okay. Just pops out like that, slides. Then put it in and tighten it up and away you go. Yep, now you're solid. Mine's last generations of iPad Pro. I I uh, anticipate that what, why, what I want to do is I want to wait till the new ones come out. I think they usually announce those at early spring. So I'm hoping because the new one has such a bright screen like the, the one that's out right now does. But I want I want the new version of the one that's out right now. Um, because the screen will go up to a thousand nits plus, so I'm hoping that that's the case. And they come out with one of those, and I think I'll upgrade to that for the drone's sake. So, um, yeah, it's good to have the bright screen. Yeah, well, I'm so spoiled by by uh, the yeah. I mean, even with the, the that the screen is the reason that I bought the bought the Cine version of the new Mavic is is at the remote because right? I'm. I'm just spoiled by having a Crystal Sky Ultra, and it's like I don't ever want to go back to flying without something that's bright that I'm putting hoods on and all that stuff. Um, okay, let's see. Do we still get to do the drone dance? Yes, so you still do the drone dance, but it's a very simple, straightforward process uh, that the, the, the app will walk you through. Uh, I have, it's very simple. I mean, it's a light aircraft, you know, you have no gimbal on, don't put your bat, uh, your props on. What Typically what I'll do is if I have traveled with it, I'll just take it out, you know, start the process, you know, circle this way, then another circle, and then you're done. And, you know, it, it 
gives you a tone and then you're you're off to the races okay yeah yeah you'll probably always have to do the this the dance with Get compass calibrations. Okay. It's a short dance. <laughs> yeah, but ours is a short dance, thankfully. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, I think I think I got that. My next question that I wrote down was, 12 minutes is the max with a loaded camera. How much difference would say a A7 R3 versus or an A1 versus an FS3 um, be able to fly with the same lens due to the different overall weights? But I think that's just yes, it will maybe a couple minutes for the lightest setup versus the the heaviest it sounds like there's yeah there's all sorts of different factors and hey something i forgot to mention to you real quick uh-huh um there's hot swap you can hot swap the batteries with the yeah. air peak yeah I... so you don't have to power down the aircraft to swap your batteries and get it back in the air so like you land it you pull one battery out put a new one in pull another battery out put a new one in back on the air in like 20 30 seconds how 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 much is the boot up process time and satellite acquisition? How much time does that take anyhow? So I I am a little impatient with it to be honest. It takes about thirty seconds to a minute depending on the area that you're flying. Satellite acquisition is pretty quick, um, but I, I I find that the the boot up process because. Uh, it's calibrating the FPV gimbal too. It's doing an actual serious kind of calibration of your FPV gimbal. Um, and it's doing a, a diagnostic on every uh, component. So it's actually you know, checking to make sure that everything works properly. Uh, so it's a little bit of a long one, but I'm, I'm impatient because I come from a build your own aircraft, hit arm, prop spin, you're in the air kind of world. Um, and, and then, you know, these are integrated systems, right? Mm -hmm. And integrated systems are much smarter than the kind of systems that you build. Right, right. Um, okay, so so hot swap, even if it's, yeah, it, the hot swap makes a lot of sense in that case because then you don't have to wait for the whole process again. Um, yep. Yeah, you got about a minute downtime when you reboot, minute, minute and a half. Okay, well, um, that's my question so far, but I think, let's see, do I have anything else? Um, you you haven't felt like severely limited by uh, range though, it sounds like. No, no, actually, I we've flown to the point where I was like, dudes, we're flying too far away, we need to bring it back, you know? <laughs> so, you I flown, asked him to bring it back once. <laughs> you've, flown, yeah. you've flown an Inspire 2. How does it feel in comparison with an Inspire 2? I mean, the Inspire 2 has um, Lightbridge 1.5, not OcuSync, which I, that's a different animal altogether. How, how do you feel that it compares? Because I'm reading two kilometers and, and right in the DJI material, it says that the, that the Inspire 2 has a seven kilometer range. Yeah, so uh, Sony definitely, uh, was very conservative. It kind of to how we were talking about with the Mavic, what it can do, and really what you can physically see it do. You know how that's kind of crazy. I think Sony, that's the mindset they took with this. It doesn't need to go any further than this because then your line of sight is is bad. You won't be able to see it uh, very well at this point. Now, for somebody like you who wants to put orange on it so you can gain uh, uh, a greater distance. Um, this is something that I would need to go out myself and, and mess around with a little bit more to really see what is the max distance if I'm breaching that 1.2 and what conditions can I breach that 1.2 miles. But compared to an Inspire, flying at the distance that is comfortable, comfortable it's safe by, and, and, and allowed by the FAA, it's, it's just it's fine. It's just like the Inspire with range, video range as well. Uh, you have, I, I flew this thing out, um, uh, about 6,000 feet uh, the other day and had uh, put y'all, set y'all to um, to spin at uh, 180 degrees per second. And so it was whipping around pretty good and I did not see any pixelation, anything like that. Okay. Right? I'm also throttling up uh, and I wanted to do it with the throttle, right? Because when you throttle up, right, you introduce noise into the system, a video transmission. Um, yep. You the motors, yep. that you don't mm -hmm. want noise. Yeah, so great test there, did very well there. 
Now, compared to an Inspire when it comes to flight performance, this it's a night and day difference. So the Inspire is a very choppy, aggressive flying kind of machine. Sometimes predictable, sometimes seemingly not predictable. Like you thought it might do this, but it didn't do the way you wanted it to do. I turned the my air, gains all down to where they're a lot slower because of that, you know, so. Yeah. The air peak is not like that. The air peak is very stable. And I, and I feel weird saying this because I like, you know, work for for Sony now doing this stuff. But what I did before, I, I, I was never married to any one drone company. I'm a very huge drone critic. The, the air peak is a very unique beast. Uh, I would compare, so you have, the air peak is like the size of the Inspire, but it flies as comfortably and as controllably as a Phantom, like a Phantom, uh, with all your vision sensors and everything on, you know, as, as res responsive as a Phantom would. Because I would, you know, Phantoms are very good flying systems. They're yeah. very predictable flying systems. But the air peak, you know, it exceeds that in the sense where it can maintain altitude is consistently predictable and can fly aggressively like an Inspire. Okay. You'll be I, I mean, happy with you it. know, I, I, when I'm looking at them, I, I'm going, you know, there's so much more weight down on the bottom compared to an Inspire where that weight is up, up more. I mean, you know, at, when the props are up, it's kind of different, but I'm, I, I, I just anticipate that there's going to be a little bit more of that pendulum effect with the, uh, air peak than than with an inspire but i don't i don't know no no, <laughs> no. let me show you something real quick actually um so it might be hard to tell but you're right it is a lot lower uh -huh. you know so your gimbal is going to be placed about here right the camera's going to be in right here right right here what you can't really tell is that there is dihedral with the with the um each motor and so the center of thrust is actually going outward a little bit by maybe about two to three degrees. Okay. And the cord line for your propellers is well below the center of weight. So, or the center, uh, yeah, yeah, your, your center of weight here. So, or your CG for the aircraft in general. So your CG actually falls somewhere like right in this area. Okay. So when the aircraft banks, it doesn't act so much as a pendulum. It's more of a fine balanced air machine. So it's able to to maintain that 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 force in a more controlled area, while all that weight is beneath the cord line of the props. These are very torquey motors. They're very wide, as you yeah, can see. Big, they're very torquey. Big ones. Uh -huh. uh, use eight and a half and an inch, eight and a half inch pitch on the props. It's able to really bite in and grab into that. Um, this is stuff that you are going to find out for yourself. I mean, it's really cool that you got one of these things. It's it's a I already paid it's for a it. Confidence-inspiring aircraft. <laughs> yeah, I already paid for it. Even um, yeah. what, what, when you when you grab that thing, where on the top should I put a strobe? Um, it, it, I, I don't want to put it over the the GPS antenna. I would put it. I've been mounting the strobe about right here. So this, really? by the way, this is my own doing. This okay. is not going to be on your aircraft. That's not the GPS. Uh, yeah, I put I put a, a PPK unit on top of it, um, but uh, yeah, you can put it right there, just drove right there. Uh -huh. um, it's just plastic. Do you use those? I'm sorry, what? I I bought some new firehouse strobes. I've got I mean I've got one that that you know somebody printed that fits on the on the back end of the Inspire, and then I've got I've got a couple of different systems, but I just decided to get the firehouse strobes for it, and they're already on their way. And then, I, so it's small, and I'll just stick it on probably with Velcro on the top of that. Just get some industrial Velcro and just put it on the top. Oh, I, it'll come with it. Does it? Oh, yep, oh, they, yep, they, oh yep. the, the, the one that they send me? Yeah, but yep. I, I, that's good. I've got, it, I've got to get one for, you know, I'll, I'll switch them between the Mavic 2 and that one. But um, I, I've, I've actually got front and back blue and i mean green and red ones too but i'm wondering i don't need those if it's bright if i feel like it's bright enough i just need the white one on the top so yeah they really did crazy with the leds your your positioning lights they're very very bright um and also the uh 
the strobes, the, the LEDs, they light up whenever you, it senses like any obstacles around it, they'll change to a blue, a very bright blue. Oh, wow. Which is good yeah. flying at dark and at night, right? Because uh -huh. like, that's such a difference between red and green. It's this very white bluish color. Okay. Um, it's cool. So yeah. That's the, that's the warning color is blue? Yep. In yep. Whenever case. it's uh, seeing like an obstacle, it's like this bright blue. Okay. Um, and then, you know, when the batter's dying, it's red. Okay. Here's my next question. W can I turn the lights off when I'm taking a shot? Yep. G does it have an automatic turn off the lights when you're taking a shot? Uh, no, but you have it within your app, the, the pilot app. Uh -huh. It's uh, so when you get to position where you want to be to you know to start your long exposure, then you can turn the light those lights off and then. That's the other reason I like to put a really bright white on the top is because then it's out of the way and and it won't affect the the thing. But when the drone is running completely dark, then it you know it's not gonna not have any uh, navigation warning for aircraft. So that's that's important to me, so. Yeah, and you don't need to worry about mounting that on top of the GPS either. This GPS unit, I've had uh, some seriously noisy components on top of this thing that should cause it to have problems. It has not caused it any issues whatsoever. Okay. It's a very strong GPS compass. Okay, let's see. Okay, well, what? tell me what else you can tell me about it. I, I mean, you. I think that's kind of. I'm off the end of my questions, but, um, but you know, what what else is there that I should know? When you go when you go demo it, what what are questions are you asked most often that I've missed? No, I, you know the the questions when we do industrial demos is, it's, is does it geotag anything? And uh, no, it doesn't geotag your images or anything like that. Uh, uh, you know. It has automatic landing gears. I don't know if you knew that about it, but the landing gears will raise and lower on its own. Can uh, I control say, that? If I want to, can I control yes. it? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Like yeah. it inspires. So, yeah. And what's cool, too, is say you have it turned off, right? So say, like, you're flying it and you decide to turn it off because you're doing, like, maybe some low-altitude sweeping shots and, like, you don't want it to lower. Right. I've had this happen before. Like when you're a really low altitude, it's not a fun experience. But you don't, you know, you have that turned off. But then down the road in your flight, you know, return to home happens because of something, and and you're you forget that you need to turn those back on. They will still come down because it's a whole separate other menu to turn the automatic landing gear off for return to home. Okay. Um, to to change that setting. Okay. So, um, on I'm the re redundant. On the return to home, how does that work? Do, will it find its way around something, or do we need to be very careful like we did with Inspire 1 um, on setting your return to home altitude every time? Uh, so it does do some light collision avoidance on the return to home. It will try to do that. It's not like going to fully navigate around something. So I would recommend that um, it's not fun to play with fire in that case. You know, to set it at a high altitude return to home or higher altitude than what it, uh, what it uh, you know, than any object. But if there is, say, one object, a tree, that might be on its path, it will see that. It will try to, to get around that. Um, return to home, the only thing that you do not want disabled when doing return to home is your vision sensors. If you disable vision sensors, even if you have GPS, the thing lands so aggressively and we'll miss the mark a little bit because GPS is only meter level accuracy. Mm -hmm. If you have your vision sensors on, it's gonna land at the place it took off, you know, nine times out of 10, depending on wind, and it's gonna be very gentle with itself too. And oh, that's something to tell you. So landing this aircraft is not, when you have your vision sensors on, it is semi-automatic. So you can be 100 feet up in the air you could dump throttle to zero percent. This thing will, you know, depending on how you ha how aggressive you have your you, uh, the the um, acceleration for descent and ascent, it will you know come down really fast. But then once it gets to the point that it wants to lower the landing gears, it will brake, lower the landing gears. You could keep you could keep the throttle still all the way zero, and then it will come down, touch down, shut off. Never 
never in the between the um, the landing gears lowering and the the landing itself throttle up um, because then it won't shut off for you. You have to just keep the throttle all the way down. Okay. You know, like how uh, most aircraft, you know, are you have to keep the throttle all the way down. But you know, with the air peak, um, some people I've noticed seem to have a tendency to think where it's doing it automatically some to some extent that it's going to do the rest automatically. So it's still like every other aircraft. You throttle all the way down, and then when the props are off, the props are off, you're, you're done. Now, if you decide to land it with vision sensors turned off, you actually have to land it like you would an older aircraft or a more manual aircraft where you might have to throttle or uh, Catch uh, it. flutter the throttle. Uh -huh. Yeah, a yeah. little bit. And if that's the case, then... You don't want to just dump it the whole time, you know, dump it all the way down. You want to be more meticulous, right? Okay. And then commit. Okay. Um, does it, and my anticipation is you're going to say no, but does it have the ability to change the, the, the home um, if you move? Will it, will it come back to, can I make it so it comes back to the remote rather than coming back to a specific point? Not at no, this point. Not at this time, yeah. Okay. That's, but that, you know what? That's a very good piece of feedback. It's something actually that I'm, I'm about to provide as well on a report because I was doing some tests with that the other day. Uh, and I will say this, another thing just to be aware of, the, uh, the radio and your home points when looking on the map uh, is not always 100% accurate. Your home point is accurate. The home point from where the drone took Because it's set it differently. Accurate. Yeah, okay. But where you are with the radio in relation to your home point might not be accurate. So let's like say you fly to it like really far out and you lost orientation of the system and you bring the map up and you want to fly the drone back to the radio. There's a chance that where the radio is is not really where you are. And then you'll be flying the aircraft across the sky, not to you. Yeah, so the, how, the how, home point is always the same. How close is it? It varies. It so, be pretty far off. so if I wanted to get back fast and my altitude, my return to home altitude was not set at 400 feet because I'm flying in the flat instead of in the mountain. I mean, my gosh, when, I, when I'm flying in the mountains, oftentimes I'll set my home point to 500 meters because I catch it before it goes up to 500 meters all the time. But I just want it to clear anything if for some reason I don't have a connection to it. And so I don't know how this connect works compared to that, but it sounds like probably the smartest thing to do is if you're if you're disoriented, hit return to home rather than flying it back. Yes. So yes, that's the smartest thing to do is just to go on ahead and initiate it because you can cancel it real quick. And another thing, you still have full control in return to home. So if you see like you have it in return to home and you see like that there might be an obstruction, uh, or you know you need to make an adjustment, you still have control of the aircraft and it's still gonna to try to come back home to you. I used to I used to use, I, I don't so much anymore, but I used to use return to home as a way, um, specifically with the Matrice, you hit return to home and then I could take and do a pan over the city with the gimbal and, and let the drone be flying, you know, it's flying the one direction, I know which direction it's flying, but I could film a different direction, almost as if I had a, a different pilot, you know, almost like a two-person op, but I was using return to home to be the pilot while I was driving the camera. So um, sometimes that's a that's a neat trick that, that works, you know, especially if you set that altitude to what you want it to be to begin with, because you know you're going to do that. But um, no, th those are those are good points. Um, but I, you know, I wonder about flying from a car or flying from a boat or flying from an ATV or any of those things. If, if you can have the ability for the, you know, it not to go back to, to where you started from specifically with a boat, that's one of those things that you'd really worry about because there's not any place to land back there, you know? Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. That's a very, very, very good point. Um, uh, in, in that case, what you would do is if you have a situation where it's going to, return to home on you, uh, you would just have it, if there's loss of link, you'd have it to set to hover. You know, uh -huh. you wouldn't have it set to do anything but right. hover. Right. Uh, but if your battery's low, then just cancel it out and bring it back manually at that yeah. point. Yeah. You know. 
Yeah, so yeah, that's um, a good. That's a scenario I never really thought of myself. So yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, I I haven't used it a lot, but I'm my, I um, I have a buddy uh, who flies. I mean, he heck, he he flew uh, Star Wars Island with IMAX. Let me put it that way. So um, you know, he's the only guy that's ever run a a drone off of Skellig Michael before ever. So um, that you know, he 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 had to fly from boats. He has to fly from boats a lot. Um, here's here's the next one, and this is something you guys can probably jump on. Um, do any of the hard case manufacturers have one of these in their possession to start cutting foam for? I'll let Dan take it. Um, yeah, on. Friday, um, they went, the uh, group went back out to Pelican uh, to do some final foam cutting. Um, don't know what the outcome of that was, but I have a meeting in just a couple minutes, uh, and I may learn there what, what happened with that. Okay. So I'll, I'll keep you posted. I've talked to GPC about it. They don't have, obviously, anything from you yet. They would love to have one and start manufacturing them. So, um, but they, they don't, they don't have one in their possession, so they don't know how to cut it. I've, I've seen these Japanese guys cutting the white styrofoam that comes out of the box to a Pelican case, size case, in order to have something to, to do this with, or try and pick and pluck foam, but pick and pluck foam for something like this is a nightmare, I think, yep. so. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll keep you posted on that. They're it's they're working feverishly right now to to get that done. Good. That that's important. The other thing that I would really like is for the the case to fit my motorized mountain bike trailer. <laughs> so who know? You know, it's not like they. Uh, but I I would I'd be very curious as to to what the dimensions of which case that they're talking about putting it in. Because yeah. um, I was ahead. just going to say the the one bit of input that we're very and Travis and I are very uh, adamant about is that it's in the smallest box where everything will fit in, um, and, and by everything I mean batteries and the gimbal and and the, everything you need to fly. So um, we we hear you. We've been. Travis and I've been doing this for a while, so we know exactly what you guys want. So we'll, good. We'll, we'll work to make it as small uh, as we can get it with everything in the box. Yeah, I think I, the, the case that I have now for the Inspire 2, I got from HPRC, the Italian one, instead. I yeah. like their foam a little bit better, and I like the setup a little bit better when I bought it. Um, I, I put, uh, uh, what are they called? They're, uh, they're not T-Motor. They're, uh, no, maybe they are. Or maybe they're Helen Gladden. I can't even remember. I put, I put the fold out, um, you know, five uh, 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 carbon fiber props on, on my Inspire too, because the I, I I was on top of Sundance Mountain, got taken up there by a ski patrolman, um, to shoot video of. I, I do one of the things that I take a lot of pictures of is American flags. We've got I belong to a a nonprofit that flies the largest free flying American flag in the world in a canyon above our our uh, our city um, where it's suspended from the sides of the canyon and I I this whole I, it's always every July and then we've got another group that's kind of our sister group that does it up in North Ogden and and theirs is uh, uh, you know Memorial Day and uh, no Veterans Day in in November and so um, that I you know I, I this whole year I've been waiting, oh, will it be here by July 24th? I mean, July 4th, or will it be here by July 4th? And then we missed that, and then I'm like, okay, maybe it'll be here by by November. No, it's not here by November, but that, uh, you know, that's that's an important one to me. But we took one of those big flags up onto the top of Sundance, and it's big, like, like uh, 178 feet by 85 feet wide. And, uh, hey, Andrew, yeah, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I know I have a thing at one o'clock. I don't know about okay. Daniel, but okay, yeah, I do too. Okay, I, I'm, well, I'm afraid if I 
hose out that will cut you guys off. So You, you might. A anyhow, um, I had to break the props off. What's the prop connection on this like? Oh, they're, uh, it's a it's a metal to metal connection, so it's got a hub, but they're not folding props. So it's got a metal hub, but non folding. Uh, it is a simple twist and lock mechanism, and then to remove it, you depress the lock and then twist again the opposite direction. So super it's relatively easy. simple, like, super simple, like very a Mavic. clean, okay, quick, okay, yeah, quick. That's that's what I needed to know. I think that's everything I that I've, I've got. So you you know I. I think we covered a lot quick. Um, I'm excited yeah. for it. I'm, I, you know, uh, tell them to ship the ones to, to picture line really fast. Cause I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to pick mine up the morning of it provided that I can do that. You know, I, they, they're, they're good to me because I buy lots of crap from them, but you know, I, I got my, most of my cameras, I get the first one out of the door with them. So um, I'm going to bring it home and, and uh, open it up for a bunch of guys that want to see them. So. Okay, great. Very, very cool. We'll follow yeah. up with a couple of the things we couldn't answer for you. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate that. All right, guys. Yeah. Thank All you, right, guys. See you later. Thank Thanks you. A lot. We'll see you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.